So hello everybody, my name is Satya Prakash and today we are going to talk about uh, Indian elections. As you must be aware that in the year 2024, we are going to witness uh, elections across the world. 4 billion people are going to vote in the elections, that is roughly half of the world's population. But amongst all the elections that we are going to see, the most exciting elections are going to be the Indian elections. The reason is the sheer number of the voters in India. If you see the present 2024 elections, about 968 million people, they are eligible to vote in the Indian elections. Now, if you see this population, if you just compare it with the other countries, US has just 160 million population. US, the oldest democracy, it has just 160 million population. If you see the entire European Union, it is somewhere around 400 uh, million voters who are going to, who will vote if the uh, entire European Union is going for elections. So if you see this particular number, it is combining the population of 90s countries where democracy exists. So just because of the fact that huge number of people are going to vote in the elections, Indian elections becomes uh, world's largest management exercise. We'll come into uh, the numbers. Election Commission is responsible for conducting all these exercises. And in past few years, there have been certain question mark on the working of the Election Commission. But it is important to understand that whenever you are analyzing any institution, you should look into the entire history of the institution and not just looking at few events occurring in few years of that institution's history. So the purpose of this particular video is to look into the task that is being performed by Election Commission, particularly the leadership of the Election Commission. But before entering into the Election Commission of India, let us just look at India's democracy and Indian election. Now, if you see, then there's a book written on how democracies die. Now, this is a book written by Stephen Levinsky and Daniel Ziblatt. They are the professors of Harvard University. And they have made this claim that whenever any leader comes to power through elections, the first thing that he tries to do is to capture the very process which brought him to that particular position, basically the election. And therefore, it is important that election should be conducted by a body which is a constitutional body and which is autonomous from the government, which is completely independent and has power to conduct a free and fair elections. Now, in past years, you will find that there are certain reports about India's democracy that say that India is uh, uh, sliding into the freedom uh, index, uh, India is a party free country, then you will find uh, some reports that India is moving towards autocracy. There are certain reports. There is a report by the Economist Intelligence Union which says uh, it comes up with democracy index and it says that India's democracy is, uh, uh, is worsening. It is changing for worse. But the interesting part in all these reports is that if you look at the election component in these reports, none of the report is saying that Indian elections are not happening in proper manner. They all agree that Indian elections are being done in a very professional, free and fair manner. That means if that is happening, we must congratulate Election Commission of India for getting this democratic exercise done. I am not saying that elections is equal to democracy. I am not saying that if elections turn out, voters turn out in the election is high, we can always assume that democracy is also good. In that case, we have the example of North Korea, where the elector, uh, the voters turn out is more than 99%. But we, we cannot say that the uh, democracy that exists, if at all it exists in North Korea, is a perfect democracy. So elections are just one component of democracy and the responsibility of ensuring fair elections is that of the Election Commission of India. Now, let us just look at certain numbers which will put in perspective that how tough is it to conduct elections in India. 969 million people are registered as Indian voters. Now, if you see the Indian constitution, 
then article 326 says that any person who is above the age of 18 has right to vote he can vote this is called as universal adult franchise now the, sometime what happens when we get things easily we start believing that this is the common sense that means this is a very normal thing but try comparing it with the other countries where women got right to vote very late in countries in advanced countries as france women got right to vote only in 1946 in some of the states in us the blacks they got right to vote as late as 1960s in us women got a uh, right to vote only around 1920s so we cannot assume that always there will be universal adult franchise but it was the vision of the constitution makers that they decided that in india anybody who is crossing certain age earlier this age was 21 years so those who are crossing this age they will have the right to vote despite the fact that where they are from which gender community what is their caste what is their class everybody is going to vote and the value of vote of each individual is going to remain same so one person one vote one value system was adopted so if you see the number of voters 969 million now this is just a comparison of how many people are going to vote in india they are at least eligible for voting so you see if this is the size of the indian voters then us has 168 million voters india has 968 us has just 168 million voters and these voters are very uniform that means if you want to communicate to them one language english is going to be enough but in india if you want to communicate you'll have to use english you'll have to use hindi and one regional language at least so these 168 million in us in uh, european union the combined uh, population the combined uh, number of the eligible voters is somewhere around 400 million so if you combine 90 countries voters into one then you get the base then you get the same number as the voters in india exist out of these 67 percent have turned out in the last election and this is again something we should note because across the world if you see this is the graph which shows that how voters are coming out to vote in their elections so if you see in oceania basically the australia new zealand region the voters turnout is declining similarly in europe the voters turnout is declining and this thick line it shows the global average it also shows that it has declined somewhere from 77 percent it has come down to 65 percent so this is the global trend of voters behavior on the other hand if you see the indian voters their turnout is increasing so you can see that voters turnout in india initially it was somewhere around 45 percent and now it has increased up to 67 percent this is one part of it the other and the better part of the story is that the voters participation if you see the gender gap has been reduced to zero so in 2019 election number of men and number of women voters voting in the elections was same so we have also reduced the gender gap it shows that more and more people are coming and participating in indian elections now there are more than 2500 political parties of course not all of them contest the elections but these are the registered political parties then the election is going to happen in 28 states eight uh, union territories and there are going to be one million polling stations uh, for there were one million polling station in 2019 so this particular chart shows that how many people vote in india and how difficult the task of election commission is now what is election commission it is a constitutional body i told that it is a constitutional body which is uh, uh, which has been created under article 324 article 324 clause 1 says that there will be one election commission of india which will be responsible for conducting the elections of president vice president and central legislature and state legislature so it is a body responsible for that recently article 324 
324 clause 2 was very much in news because this article talks about the appointment process and the election. Now, article 324 clause 2 says that either the appointment will happen through a law legislated by the parliament of India or in the absence of this law, the president is going to appoint the election commissioners. Okay. Now, till now, the law was not legislated till 2024 and therefore, the appointment was happening through the president and if president is appointing, that means government is appointing. Now, last year, there was one case called Anub Baranwal case, wherein the Supreme Court said that the appointment can now happen either through a law, if parliament gets that law or Supreme Court said that we are going to form a collegium. This collegium will have the prime minister, it will have the leader of the opposition and the chief justice of India. This collegium is going to appoint the election commissioners or parliament is free to get the law. Parliament got a law this year and there has been a slight change in this composition and the slight change is that the chief justice of India has been replaced with one of the ministers appointed by the prime minister. And in the recent appointment that happened of the two election commissioners, this collegium consisted of prime minister, home minister and the leader of opposition. The problem is that there is a demand as if at all this three member committee, three member collegium which is now not having the chief justice of India and having two members from the government side, one member from the opposition side should decide on the basis of unanimity. That means only if all the three members agree to one name, the person should be appointed as election commissioner. But the fact is that this particular body is working on majority basis. That means if two out of the three members are saying that this person should be appointed as the election commissioner, the person would be appointed. And here comes the problem. The opposition complains that this particular body is biased towards the government. That is the politics part of it. So, if you look at article 324, clause 1 says that uh, the responsibility of the superintendence of the election to parliament, legislature, president and vice president is with uh, the election commission of India. And clause 2 that in the absence of a law, if there is a law, of course, that law would be uh, uh, handling the appointment process or the president of India will be making the appointment. Now, as I told at the start of the presentation that any institution actually the character of any institution is determined by its leadership. And today I will be talking about two of the election commissioners who made their mark in this uh, particular institution and it is because of them uh, you can say that the institution got its own identity. The kind of election commission that you see today, uh, one of the uh, reason behind that is these two people. Okay, Of course, others have also uh, uh, worked, but these two election commissioners, they have uh, done commendable job and we should talk about this. Uh, the 10th election commissioner of uh, chief election commissioner of India, TN Session. He was a 1954 batch IS officer from uh, Tamil Nadu cadre. Earlier he was selected in IPS, then he became IS 1954. He retired from the cabinet secretary. He was uh, the 18th cabinet secretary and after that he became the 10th chief election commissioner of India. Now, after him, his tenure was from 1990 to 1996. After him, no chief election commissioner has completed the full six year tenure. It is only TN session after him, no election commissioner has uh, completed six years. Now, he was also awarded the Raman Maxisse Award uh, for uh, contribution into governance in 1996. Now, you see whenever you go to vote, you see a photo ID card. Okay, Only if you are getting that, that is one way of identifying you. Of course, there can be other ways of photo ID card, but then the photo ID card was just voter ID. Now, that was uh, introduced by TN uh, session. 
he said that until unless the in, uh, we are getting those photo id cards i'm not going to conduct the elections because in those days especially in the northern part up and bihar the elections were rigged elections me kafi violence hote the aur logon ki jaane bhi jati thi wahan pe he said that until unless and bahut bogus voting hota tha that means uh, uh, somebody else is going to vote on somebody's else's name he says that i am going to get the photo id card and then only election will happen he postponed many elections until unless the photo id cards were ready it was said that tn session has politicians in the breakfast aur aisa bhi kaha jata tha ki tn session the indian politicians are afraid of only two people tn session and god so there was a fear among politicians on tn session because they knew that this man is not going to compromise whatsoever with the electoral with the free and fair nature of the election process aaj hum मॉडल कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट के बारे में सुनते हैं द मॉडल कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट ऑफ कोर्स इट वॉज इम्प्लीमेंटेड बाई दिस मैन एंड ही मेड श्योर दैट दिस इज नॉट वायलेटेड एंड यू मस्ट रिमेंबर दैट मॉडल कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट इज नॉट अ स्टैचुटरी मैकेनिज्म इट इज नॉट अ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल मैकेनिज्म ऑल दो इट इज नॉट इन्फोर्सिबल बाई लॉ येट द इलेक्शन कमीशन इज एबल टू मैनेज टू डू सो ही यूज टू गो टू द सुप्रीम कोर्ट if there's any kind of ambiguity he would go to supreme court and he would uh, derive the power given in article 324 so tn session is one officer who is responsible for uh, conducting free and fair elections in india especially in the northern part of india in fact uh, when you are writing any essay or you are writing the ethics paper you can give his example uh, there he actually worked on the principle zero delay zero deficiency elections would not be postponed and there should not be any error in the elections so the multiple stage voting was introduced by tn session only because he knew that the resources especially the security forces that uh, uh, in election commission was utilizing it was not sufficient to have election on one day in the entire country so he went for phased uh, elections he reduced the risk of booth capturing and violence so these are some of his achievement another election commission that we uh, elect chief election commissioner that we must talk about he was uh, basically a bureaucrat from shillong and uh, a bihar cadder is officer he also retired as a cabinet secretary and after retiring as the cabinet secretary he joined the election commission initially he joined election commissioner uh, as a election commission as a election commissioner in 1997 uh, when ms gill was the Uh, chief election commissioner and then in 2001 uh, he became the chief election commissioner of india now there are two instances wherein we see that how he ensured the free and fair nature of the elections one was in 2002 when uh, kashmir elections were going to happen now these elections are going to happen after 15 years and in 2002 the law and security situation of kashmir it was very challenging terrorism was at its peak there was involvement of the foreign players pakistan uh, you know uh, pushing people pushing money here to create that uh, instability in kashmir now in that context he has to uh, get the elections stuff there was one opinion that was put that the elections in jammu and kashmir Uh, should be done under foreign uh, intervention that means uh, uh, people from europe america they should come to uh, come here and they should uh, uh, no get conducted the elections of jammu and kashmir he said no kashmir is part of india and elections in kashmir is the responsibility of the election commission of india which is the constitutional body and which is responsible for free and fair election under article 324 clause 1 and therefore he said that we don't require any white man to come from europe and get the elections conducted in india we can manage our affairs and he got the elections done in a proper manner another instance comes in 2002 itself 2002 gujarat uh, riots occurred in the state the government then under the chief ministership of narendra modi it was uh, the full term was ending in 2003 however the government wanted uh the government wanted a snap election so although the full term was till 2003 but government was dissolved in 2002 itself in fact the precise date was 19th july 2002 the government was dissolved now when the election commission is going there to see the situation because first election commission uh, analyzes that whether it is possible to get the election conducted or not 
the election commission found in its report that the situation is not good enough to conduct the election why because recently the violence has occurred that also on uh, the parameters of religion and therefore the situation is communally charged secondly many people were still living in camps and they were if they are living in camp probably they won't be able to vote and therefore if they are not able to vote a major chunk of the population will remain out of the electoral cycle and therefore election commission said that we are not ready to conduct elections in 2002 in gujarat now this becomes a classic case of constitutional conflict why because under article 174 the assembly elections need to be conducted before six months that means uh, of course uh, within six months the new government needs to be for, uh, formed so within six months the election is to be conducted but here the election commission of india is saying that we are not going to conduct the election because the situation is not right it became a conflict of article 324 versus article 174 so this is a classic example of a constitutional crisis and therefore, this matter was referred to the President of India that it is a constitutional crisis. President has the power under Article 143 to consult to the Supreme Court. And it, President asked, AP, uh, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam was the President of India. He asked the Supreme Court that what should be the way forward in this. Supreme Court studied this matter and it clearly said that we are not going to force the Election Commission to get the election conducted if the situation is not right that means election it is election commission's responsibility that whether the election can be done at this point of time or not so basically supreme court uh, underlined the importance of independence of the election commission of india and this could happen because the institution was being led by the chief election commissioner j m Lind. And that's why it is in fact, there was a question also in the previous year, an essay, that the character of any institution is decided by the leadership. So we see that when you have a very strong leadership, then the institution is also becoming quite prominent. He was also uh, rewarded uh, uh, the Raman Maxisse uh, Award. In fact, commenting on uh, the working of J.M. Lindo, the then BJP leader, uh, Arun Jetli said that he is a cowboy bureaucrat and he thinks that under article 324 election commission has become God. So such political uh, comments keep on uh, coming because of course there will be resistances from the political class if the election commission is you know, uh, not allowing the elections to happen. And therefore at this point of time in 2024 when India is going to have elections and uh, uh, more than 950 million voters are uh, expected to participate. Of course, around 70 percent are going to participate. It is important that Indians should have faith in the Election Commission of India. Despite all the negative things that we talk about uh, the institutions, there are two institutions over which Indians rely most. One is the Supreme Court of India. People believe, chahe kuch bhi ho jaye, judiciary jo hai, nyaay palika hamesa nyaay karegi. And the second institution is the Election Commission of India itself. That faith needs to be maintained. And uh, in fact, free and fair election is one of the basic structure of the Indian constitution. In a very fam uh, famous case, Indra Gandhi versus Rajendra 1975, Supreme Court has declared free and fair elections as the basic structure of Indian constitution. I would like to conclude this session by quoting uh, Hillary Clinton, former uh, Secretary of State of US. She said that the working of Indian elections, it is the gold standard. So the whole world needs to learn the electoral process and how the election commission is working in such a challenging condition, wherein you have seventh largest uh, country. Uh, we have uh, uh, election booths being put even in the border areas. We have uh, security challenges. We have geographical challenges. We have social challenges. Yet election commission is able to conduct the election it is the biggest possible management exercise across the world which election commission has been doing for last more than 70 years and therefore let us hope that in 2024 also election commission is going to set new example thank you so much